Hello, folks, and welcome back to True Crime Phenomenon. Uh, this is episode number three on Scott Peterson and the murder of Lacey Peterson and Connor Peterson, their unborn son. Now, just a, a quick um, quick correction on the time frame. Um, before there was the uh, 1018 uh, dog behind the gate, um, I've recently learned that there was also a 10.30 a.m. There was the mailman says that the dog wasn't there, and this was never heard in court. So the mailman essentially went to the scene and uh, was unable to identify the dog being behind the gate, which is where the mailbox is, okay? So a few other things I stumbled upon. Uh, this actual episode is going to be about the evidence, right? So I'm going to get to the trial next but we're going to go through the evidence. So when we go through the trial, there's a perspective of where the evidence comes from. So uh, mailman says dog was not there and never heard in court. Uh, there was also a juror that lied about uh, some uh, domestic abuse in their past to get on the jury. And um, uh, in the past couple of years, uh, Scott Peterson's uh, death sentence was reduced to uh, life without parole. Okay. Now I want to read a quick article that came from the Modesto B and uh, the Modesto B was basically outlining the, uh, what the forensic experts are saying. And I quote, uh, forensic experts say it will be tough for investigators to recover from the decomposed remains, any hard physical evidence that will convict Scott Peterson of charges that he killed his wife and their unborn baby. The corpses recovered from a beach just a few miles from the Berkeley Marina where Scott Peterson told police he was fishing that day. Uh, he reported Lacey's, uh, that day he reported Lacey's disappearance. May have spent uh, four months in the cold San Francisco Bay waters. And while Lacey's unborn son washed ashore with his umbilical cord still attached, her remains were reportedly in an advanced state of decay with only uh, uh, the torso intact. Okay, so all of Lacey's and, uh, limbs and internal organs were missing. And part of this has to do with the anchors, which we're going to go through some of the evidence. You can see some of it on the screen at the moment. Okay, so the internal organs were missing as well as the limbs. And the uh, prosecution's pathologist testified in a preliminary hearing that he could not determine a cause of death, could not determine a cause of death due to the advanced uh, state of decomposition, okay? Now, so uh, we're gonna go through the evidence. And so here are the pliers that uh, were kind of infamous, right? So these pliers were actually found on Scott's boat. There was apparently one hair on the pliers and the hair matched uh, Lacey Peterson's DNA, apparently. Now, if you take a look, here is where the pliers were initially found, right? So the, the yellow pliers were in the boat, you know, kind of uh, not really hidden, just, you know, somewhere where you reach down, grab the pliers, pull the hook. Now, that being said, you know, myself, I have to clean hair out of the drain of my shower all the time, something I deal with. Uh, I don't think I don't have a boat, so I, I, I don't know if I would take those particular pliers and throw them into my boat to use, but, you know, who knows? I mean, there's, there's times where you have, you know, maybe a tool in your car, you go grab it to do a job, and then you put them back because you're using them for something different, right? Okay, so that being said, the yellow pliers, um, I, I don't give a whole lot of weight to them, though, you know, I do understand why some people do. Okay, now there was this other crumpled carpet that uh, was suspicious, right? A, suspic a suspiciously scrunched up rug, which tested negative for blood or trace evidence. So there's no evidence, no blood, no nothing, just a scrunched up rug, which could have got caught in the door. Who knows? I mean, it just seems like a silly piece of evidence. It was that was reported in the papers. It was this big deal and just really ended up being nothing. It had no evidence, no trace evidence, nothing to offer the prosecution, okay? And then we go down. <clears throat> okay, blood in the truck. 
So prosecutors indicate they'll introduce photos of blood found on the visor and the door of the defendant's truck. Apparently, the blood in the photos was traced back to Scott, not Lacey Peterson. Think about that. The blood in the truck, which was minor, you know, visor and door, you know, maybe, maybe he cut himself fishing. Who knows, right? Was not Lacey Peterson's. And during an interview, Peterson said there might be plenty of blood in there from me explaining that he sometimes cuts his hands while working. And that makes sense. It does make sense to me. You know, who knows? Maybe he got into a confrontation with Lacey and cut his hands at that point. I don't know. Now, uh, see, on December 30th, uh, Bloodhounds indicated that Lacey Peterson had left home by car. Okay, so Lacey Peterson uh, left home by car, and this was done on the 30th. Now, this one is kind of confusing for me. This is one of those ones that's like, okay, well, maybe Scott, maybe Scott did put her in, in the truck. Who knows, right? Maybe when he was uh, loading up those uh, umbrellas, uh, maybe he was loading up uh, Lacey Peterson. You know, it's one of those things I kind of ponder. You know, there was also a witness that saw Scott, uh, apparently saw Scott on the freeway and, uh, you know, he kind of, he, he stopped for gas or something and he took off and these people sped up to him trying to tell him, hey, your tailgate's open. You have something in your, uh, uh, in your bed, the bed of your truck. You don't want it to fly out. Apparently they, he gave him some, you know, crazy look and grimace and sped off and just ignored them. So, you know, I'm not real sure what to think about that one. You know, if somebody did in fact hurt her, you know, they may have loaded her up when she got back. So maybe she went for the walk, came back, somebody heard her, loaded her up and took her to dispose of the body. Because at this point, with the 24-hour news cycle, the information about where Scott was, where, where Lacey went missing, the burglary, everything was all out in the open. So if there was somebody who had the body hidden somewhere, I mean, it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to throw it, you know, where Scott was fishing. Because if you really look back at the evidence, the things that convicted Scott Peterson of this murder was, one, his relationship with Amber Fry. That was a huge thing, right? Motive. That gives him some sort of motive. Uh, two was, um, uh, was his uh, non-reaction, his non-reaction to her death or her disappearance. So that was something that was very suspicious to, you know, kind of his aloof behavior. He was just apathetic to the whole situation and the way he wasn't going on TV and expressing concern and doing all these things. It's one of those things that really, really brought the focus in uh, by police. Now, um, then the other thing would be the anchors, right? So, uh, the police believe that there was, you know, dust everywhere for these anchors, which I'm going to go into the anchors. I actually have some pictures of what they found. And, you know, if you believe what Scott says, I mean, it seems to describe what he says actually happened, where he made, you know, one anchor. So we'll go ahead and go a little bit further. And we'll take a look at that. Okay, so if you look at this round area right here, that is the edge of the bucket where he allegedly made the anchor. So they said he made uh, five anchors, uh, one to hold down each limb, you know, the uh, two, two legs, two arms, and the head. So they said he made a five additional anchors. But if you look on the table, this is the only round spot where there's actually dust around it. Now, I, I was trying to find a picture of, of where... Um, of where the uh, sprinkled <laughs> the sprinkled dust from the concrete is next to the driveway because it's very clear, easy to find. I'm um, just having a hard time finding those pictures. If I can find those, I'll, I'll bring those up in another video in the future. But this seems to indicate that you know he just kind of sloppily <laughs> sloppily made these anchors, and you could see the picture over there where he used the water and kind of poured it into the to the bucket, made his anchor and kind of moved on. You know, uh, nobody accused Scott of being uh, a good guy or, or a smart guy, that's for sure. 
you know, he, he does a lot of dumb things and especially his relationship with these, um, with, with, uh, uh, Amber Fry was just so foolish. It's so stupid. Now, the other thing that kind of gets me is he says it was too cold to golf that day. So he decides to go fishing, which if anybody fishes, you know, it's freezing you know, to the 10th degree out on the water. So if you're going to go out in the Bay Area where it's super cold all the time and that wind is just going to freeze you right out. So that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Now, he says he went out there for an hour, left early because it started raining. Um, I have a hard time buying that personally. So that those are my hangups. My hangups are, uh, you know, the the car leaving his, you know, kind of his his strange behavior, uh, as well as him uh, him monitoring the police while they're dredging that area. Which, I mean, it, that is what it is. Uh, who knows? I mean, if if uh, you know my wife were missing and they were looking for her in a particular place, I might go go to watch to see if they found if they find anything. You know, if he actually is grieving and he is missing his wife, I'm sure he'd want to know as soon as possible. Um, but it does look suspicious. You know, I, I do agree with that. It looks super suspicious. Now, suspicious behavior does not equal um, guilty in my mind. So um, my personal opinion is I do think Scott either did it or has something to do with it. Now, I'm able to separate that from his judicial findings. I don't believe there's enough evidence to convict him of first degree murder. However, in my personal opinion, I do think that he did it or had something to do with it in, in some way or form. How that uh, really represents itself, I don't know. But it's, it's just, it's hard to say, right? He's just got this awkward, awkward way about him. Now, so... Uh, I thought this was interesting. Um, I found on the site where it's got the evidence, uh, innocent circumstance, and uh, guilty inference. So it's got the different types of evidence, right? Okay, so the secret boat purchase. So Scott Peterson, uh, the innocent circumstance, Scott Peterson did not want his wife to know he had bought himself a boat and other items. Okay, I get that. But then there's also uh, the neighbor that said, well, Scott actually brought her by, brought Lacey by, uh, on the 23rd, and she saw the boat. So it's hard to say. And then the guilty inference is uh, Peterson had been planning his wife's watery grave for a month. Okay. Uh, see, evidence lies about his dead wife. Uh, Peterson told lies his wife uh, and the woman he was having an affair with. Uh, right. So, I mean, he's uh, obviously, if you're having an affair, you're lying. Now, this is before social media, before people could go online and really look you up and find out about you. So, I mean, if he's trying to carry on this secretive relationship, this is way before you can find anything online. So I do kind of understand that. Uh, I find it really full. He'd have to be really stupid to tell him, oh, my wife died. And then two weeks later, go and kill her. That just makes no sense to me. You know, I mean, that just seems like a guilty verdict waiting to happen. Uh, guilty inference there is uh, Peterson wanted his wife dead and spoke about it openly. That just seems so foolish to me. Uh, I mean, like I said, nobody accused him of being a, a brilliant person, but it's just something completely foolish in my opinion. Now, the concrete bags and concrete dust. Uh, prior to his wife's disappearance, Peterson was using concrete. It's the kind of the innocent, uh, the innocent circumstance. Uh, see, anchors were being built to sink the corpse is the guilty inference. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you're planning it ahead of time, it makes sense. Like he was something you would do. And, you know, if he was, in fact, dumping the body that day, I'm sure he was shocked to see when it came up. And maybe that's why he drove up there to watch because he was scared. Oh, no, shit. What are they going to find, you know, freaking out? But, you know, who knows what he's actually thinking? Let's see, the computer evidence. Uh, Peterson's computer was used to view various websites near the time his wife went missing. Uh, defendant was planning and researching his crimes. Okay, don't have much to say about that. I mean, we, we obviously know he was on his computer. 
uh, from uh, 1030 on. Um, Lacey was spotted by the different witnesses walking around that circle uh, from, you know, kind of that 1030 a.m. to you know, 1130 approximately around that time frame. Okay, so let's see. Uh, the hair evidence. At some point, the strand of Lacey Peterson's hair was transferred to Scott Peterson's boat by somebody in some fashion. You know, and this this can happen. You know, I, I've got my wife's hair on me all the time. In fact, I, I pulled one off of like my ear earlier. It was kind of weird, but, you know, that does happen. Uh, however, being on his pliers, I don't know. That's just kind of strange. Oh, Scotty P, what are you doing, buddy? Uh, see, after killing his wife, uh, Peterson put her in his boat. Now, the way that the hair was in the pliers looked like he was pulling something out. So either he's pulling hair out of her head or he's pulling hair out of a drain. That's initially where my thoughts went. Was he, oh, he's pulling hair out of a drain to unclog a drain. That's what I do. You know, you go find my wife's hair in there right now. So, you know, please don't go missing. Uh, the morning cell phone call. Now, this is another thing that's kind of weird to me is the phone calls that he makes. I mean, they do sound kind of upbeat, whatever, but they also sound like, you know, calls that I've heard before where people are trying to cover their tracks. So, you know, oh, hey, wasn't I able to get out there to, pop, you know, get Papa's basket? Can you go out and do that for me? Hoping you could do that. Love you. You know, this lovey-dovey husband. And it's just, I don't, you know, I don't know. I guess is where I fall on that one. Um, so uh, morning phone call at 10.08 a.m. on the day his wife went uh, missing. Peterson was near his home, right? So he had called back to the house and um, the cell phone towers pinged by his house. Uh, the Peterson dog was seen at 10.18. So Lacey Peterson must have already been murdered. Now, um, the 1018 time frame is kind of up for debate, especially when you have the uh, postal worker saying that the dog was not there at 1030 a.m. So somebody moved the dog or the dog was hiding or um, they have the time frame off. I don't know, but that's just just weird. Uh, see the beige pants. The victim's body was recovered in April, dressed in something other than what Peterson remembers last seeing her wearing in December. At some point, her clothes were changed. I see Peterson lied about the black pants because he knew his wife was seen wearing beige that day before he killed her. Now, um, the witnesses that see her walking around the neighborhood all see her wearing black leggings. You know, this was before or uh, after Scott did his interview saying she was wearing black leggings when he left that day. So you know, when the body was recovered, she was wearing beige pants. So she either, either they saw somebody else, these witnesses, they did not see Lacey. They saw somebody else that was walking their dog or she went home and changed after the walk and something else happened to her. Um, see, next one, no signs of a struggle in the home. Uh, there probably wasn't a violent struggle in the Peterson's home, is the innocent response. Uh, guilty inference, kidnappers didn't do it. They would have struggled with Lacey Peterson in her home. You know, and this is one of those things that, that I don't really understand. So if somebody had abducted her from her house. Maybe they were burglarizing her house and she walked in on them and they just strangled her and killed her and then disposed of the body. You know, that's a possibility. Or she went next door across the street and butted into those people and said, hey, what are you doing in my neighbor's house? Get out. And, you know, she had the dog with her as some sort of protection. Dog takes off and, you know, they strangle her, get rid of the body and, and they go from there. Or it is Scott, or Scott strangled her, smothered her, you know, what have you. And all these uh, 11 people that saw her are all mistaken. The, um, the post, uh, postal worker, mistaken. All these witnesses are mistaken. But the, the strange thing to me is there's so many witnesses that contradict the prosecution's narrative. There's far more that contradict it than actually hold it up. 
far more, like quadruple the amount. I mean, I think there's two witnesses that that uh, that say they saw the dog. You know, one at ten eighteen, then another one. You know, says they saw him uh, uh, speeding off in his truck and with this menacing look. You know, I just don't know what to think about that. Why? Uh, you know, the police are often accused of having this narrow focus. And I tend usually not to agree with with that um, theory, because usually it's not this narrow minded focus. Normally, they've got the right person. You know, it's very rare that we have a a wrongful, an actual wrongful conviction. Very, very, very rare. So, uh, is you know, is this one of those cases? Um, I don't know. I guess that's for a jury to decide, not for us. And it looks like he may actually be getting a, um, a new trial. You know, his, uh, his sister-in-law has been out making the rounds, doing interviews. Um, you know, the, uh, the article I read earlier uh, from uh, today was from August 2021, where I got most of this information about the dog being behind the gate, the mailman, the juror. Um, this was all from a, a, an article from today in August 25th, 2021. Today is the, uh, is the publication. August 25th, 2021, you can go read it yourself. And uh, she's outlining new information that is supposedly coming forth or that the jury has not heard. And I think the jury has a right to hear this stuff. You know, I, I really do. There was actually one guy who was kicked off the jury that you would say is more uh, pro defense. So what he would what he would go on the media and say is like, look, if I were on that jury, I wouldn't have convicted because they they just haven't given enough data in order to convict. Now he was uh, kicked off the jury because another juror wrote to the judge and said this you know this guy that was uh, very pro uh, prosecution wrote to the judge and said, you know, hey, this guy's talking about the case. He's doing this. He's doing that. You know, so he really, you know, he needs to be off the case. And uh, so next day he's gone. Now, the one thing that I would say bothers me about our particular system is the releasing of all this data. And you saw it a lot in the Stephen Avery case, too where they would trot out uh, these different defendants or uh, witnesses and different information and just parade it in front of the public. And what possible chance do these people have to have a fair jury trial? What possible chance do they have when you've got, uh, you know, you've got cases like uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, right? You've got the president of the United States weighing in, saying it's a modern day lynching. I mean, how is that guy going to have a fair trial? I'm shocked he was found innocent. You know, even though, you know, my opinion, he clearly was. I mean, you got people chasing him with a gun and uh, another guy with a skateboard getting ready to crack him over the head with it. And he, you know, protects himself. That is like the most clear cut self-defense I've ever seen. So, uh, you know, it makes me wonder, are people watching something different or are they just so ingrained in what they're being told by the media? And, you know, this was uh, kind of my thought process was, you know, Scott's guilty. I mean, the the media has programmed this into me that he's a guilty man. There's no question. Look at his behavior. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what the media thinks. It's what's proven in court. Did they prove it beyond a reasonable doubt? And what is a reasonable doubt in your mind? What do you think is a reasonable doubt? In fact, in the comments below, what do you define as a reasonable doubt in this case? What is reasonable doubt enough for you to overturn this conviction and set Scott Peterson free? You know, I would have a hard time setting him free because I think he did it, but I believe in justice and I believe in, in you know, righteous justice for everybody. Because if Scott Peterson doesn't get a fair trial, then neither do I. You know, God forbid I was ever in this situation. I would want to have a fair trial. You know, and I think here in America, we need to re-examine 
when we cover these trials. I think that all this information should not be released until after they're found guilty or innocent. Then we can start weighing the facts out. But until then, we should not be making assumptions on these people. They should be presumed innocent. You know, Scott was presumed guilty. Presumed. I know I did. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of that. And I need to be better and I'm trying to be better. And that, I guess this is kind of my effort to try to be better to presume innocence. I don't like Scott. I don't think he's a good guy. I think he's a terrible guy. He's a cheater. He's a liar. But it doesn't make him a murderer. And it doesn't make the proof and the very loose circumstantial uh, evidence proof. So let me know. Uh, this is Josh with a uh, true crime phenomenon with our phenom of the week. Mr. Scott Peterson, let me know in the comments below. What do you think is reasonable doubt in this case? What would you accept? Please like, subscribe, share. Dying to know what you think. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. And uh, episode four will be coming out soon where we'll be going over the trial. And then um, I'm actually going to do a fifth episode where we're actually going to uh, do a comparison with somebody coming in cold. And uh, I'm going to go over the evidence and all the different stuff. And we're going to go back and forth on what she thinks of all of this evidence that she's never heard. So I want to bring in a third party person that's never heard any of this stuff. So anyways, like I said, like, subscribe, share, leave in the comments below. Uh, what do you think about the evidence? And what do you think about reasonable doubt? In my mind, that's the most important part of this case.